Well, here we are in Owatonna, Minnesota, and I have the pleasure to be sitting with my dear friend and fellow combat veteran, uh, Bob Molenhauer. And of course, that's his real name. That's his given name, but his real name is Moose. And so the only thing that we've ever referred to you as is Moose. For a long time. And, and uh, kind of an interesting little story there when we went on the first mis fishing trip. Or maybe I, was I, I, whatever. We're sitting with all the guys at the bar, and I caught, no, it was the elk trip. Remember when, when you oh, were in Dillon? Yeah. And, and Moose invited me up for a couple of days, and I, all I ever called him was Moose. And you remember those guys hooting and hollering? Yeah. They'd, they'd ne they had no idea. Kenny the, and his boys. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, to say the least, Moose and I went through a lot of uh, combat together. We went. To, we were involved in a lot of gunfights, and and uh, we saw a lot of silly stuff, a lot of stupid stuff, uh, and through it all, we both miraculously were able to get home and and uh, uh, have families and and continue on with our lives. And when I started this project in 2003. When I started looking for the guys, Moose was one of the first guys that I found, and and we talked, we kicked the idea around about having reunions, and and uh, between Ray and and Russ Bruns and and Moose and I, we decided that it would be worth a chance, and we went to Washington D.C. and had our first reunion, and uh, I I think probably the reason that we're sitting here today is because of your continued. You've never not supported me, and and the effort, and and that's why. I mean, that's I. You know, it's like you can't do it on your own. Well, thank and you. And you've, you've always, you know, you were the guy that always came came up behind me and shoved something in my pocket. <laughs> and yeah, right. Yeah, pretty much. And, and uh, even over there. <laughs> hey, you know. So, but anyway, and I'm going to start out by just asking you, what what's your date of birth? Four two forty eight. Okay. And where were you born and raised? Owatonna, right here. And uh, so you, you born and raised here after the war, you came back? Yep. Okay. And did you volunteer for the service or did you get drafted? No, I was drafted. I was drafted actually while I was in high school and then got a deferment after that because of the business my father was in. Which was? Uh, tiling, farm drainage. Okay. And it went along with the farm package. And uh, then about six months later, uh, they really had a call for troops, and I got called up. And from there, I went from here. I went to uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I did my basic training at Fort Campbell, and uh, left there. Uh, I'm guessing the end of May. I'm going to I'm going to back you up just a second. Sure. Did you get a greetings letter? Oh yeah. So you didn't go down and say No, no. Okay, no, cuz some some letter. guys went and got a 2-year deferment. Uh, no, they only had to do 2 years if they joined. Oh, okay. instead of the the 3. The 3. Yeah. And and they wound up with an RA. Yep. But they only had to do 2 years. That wasn't no. you. No. You, you you're like me. You no, just, I had to re up twice to get out of the hospital. You <laughs> But, but, <laughs> well, <laughs> you did what you had to do. And you know what we always used to say about guys that re opt? Yeah. <laughs> not all, not all there. Uh, how old were you when you, when you went in? Uh, 19. Okay. And uh, you got your greetings letter. What, what did you feel about that when you got it and read it? What was your initial feeling? Well, I guess I was ready to serve. It, you know, I kind of knew that I had a bunch of cousins and a bunch of my high school buddies and friends and whatnot that uh, they were all in line, so mm -hmm. we just went. And did you have a sense of like patriotism or duty? Oh yeah, you bet. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I kind of did too. A lot of guys yep. say that when they got drafted, you know, they were mad or oh, yeah. made them mad or they were thinking about going to Canada or. You know, just 
ditching, you yep. know, your draft and so out. forth. Yep. And I remember myself, I thought, you know, I, I just, I was stupid. You know, the reason I got drafted is because I thought it was more important to chase girls and make money. Yeah. Where'd, so, the, where'd the was come from? <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> and of course, the minute I dropped out of college... The, I didn't know that the college was legally obligated to contact Selective Service and tell them all the guys that dropped out. Oh, and sure. I was put to the top of the list, and I got my letter probably within six months. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, I thought to myself, well, you kind of brought this on yourself. And uh, I, I went in with the thought of I, I was going to do the patriotic I felt like it was a duty, and I would yeah. do it. Yeah. And, and, and I always remember, I thought we were going over there to fight communism. That was the main, I mean, that was the main thing that- That was what they, what they told were, us. Yeah. yeah, and so I thought, well, I'm, you know, at that moment, I never thought of the chance of getting hurt or killed I, because I had no, no way of knowing. Yeah. And uh, did, did you know anybody before going into the service that had ever gotten hurt or killed? In oh Vietnam? yeah, there was a couple of kids from town here that had already gotten killed and came back here. Yeah, and that was the my first wake up call. Yeah, there was a kid that I went to high school with. I I didn't even think about Vietnam when I, after during that time, and there were twins. They were the Testa twins, and Eddie was a buddy of mine. And the day after graduation, he joined the Marines. Oh, and and went over there. And within two weeks of being there, he got shot between the eyes. Hmm. And that n news got back to that high school thing and spread like wildfire. Oh, I'm sure. And uh, that was the first time that I ever stopped and thought, I, I didn't think about me going to Vietnam, but I thought, that's a bad place. Yeah. Vietnam yeah. is not. That could be fun. Yeah. And, and so uh, you, you just thought you're going to just get in line like, and, and just do it. Do what I needed to do. Where did you go to basic? Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Okay. And what do you specifically remember about Fort Campbell? Well, uh, it was a whole different sequence to me, of course. I'd never been involved with anything like that. I mean, I was in the Boy Scouts, but there's really no Was it during the winter or? It was early in the spring. We had snow and tornadoes. Yeah. And rain. Yeah, it could be the coldest cold that. Absolutely. I, I, my last six months I served there. Oh, okay. I, I was a DI at Fort Campbell, and okay. I, I've never experienced the cold. That C-3-3. Oh, brother. And where'd you do AIT? At Fort Lewis, Washington, okay. North Fort. Okay. And there was something kind of interesting in your story about you and John Cook. You were in basic together. Right. We met in basic training at Fort Campbell and stayed together through that, and then we had about four days transit up to Fort Lewis, and uh, we were in the same barracks up there, and we came home for 15 days we had off, and uh, the call was really high then. Oh, yes. So uh, Largest draft in the history of the United States. We, uh, we came home for uh, a couple of days. Of that was, I think, the 15th, 14th or 15th of September. We had to be back in Oakland. And uh, be darned if I got there and there wasn't John standing again. And, and you uh, thought to yourself, what are the chances of this? Yeah, really. I mean, you know, we figured who's, who's going to go away. Everybody went their separate ways. Yeah, yeah. yep. And uh, we shipped up in the same uh, plane to Alaska. And uh, from Alaska to Yakota, and from Yakota back into to Vietnam, and be darned if we went out in the field in the same truck, and ended up in the same platoon. Now that the chances of that are nuts. Oh, just unbelievable. So, yep. when when you, what date did you get into Vietnam? Do you remember? Not the exact date, but it had to be. Early October, do you, do you first remember, week maybe. Do you remember when you stepped off the plane and you put your first footstep on Vietnam soil, what you were thinking? We didn't get to step off. We taxied in uh, under a mortar attack, and uh, pilot 
of course, there was no crew on the mm -hmm. ship anymore, just a pilot and his crew. And uh, he got on the horn and said, I'm going to taxi. There's a motor attack here. I'm going to taxi down to the end of the runway. And I'm going to turn around slow and let the chutes out the back and belly dump the gear. And you oh, my gosh. Better be down that chute because it's only going to take me about 40 seconds to get back up to 60 miles an hour. Yeah, and get this thing off the ground. And get this thing off the ground because I can't leave it here in a mortar attack. Yep. And so that's what we did. And uh, it was dark. I got uh, got up and ran to the side of the runway and be darned if I didn't find a set of trailer duels over there and I jumped underneath this trailer and uh, till the mortar attack was over and then we came out and started sorting out our gear and whatnot and uh, I looked back over to where I was hiding under and, and it was an Owatonna bandwagon made right oh, here for in Owatonna. Sake. They had dozens of them over there for the USO shows. Oh and, man. And, uh, so that was kind of a, I don't know, different, different, and then then they took again. then they took you to Long Bend from then there. Then we went to Long Bend, and you went to the uh, I, what did, what did they call that? The replacement center. Yep, repo depot. Yep. And uh, what was that like? So it was pretty mixed up and crazy. It was kind of shifting you around, trying to find out where you were at and whatnot. And in in the repo depot, I lost John. But then when we both ended up in Coochie to come out to the hard spot you guys were on, by God, they put us both on the same truck and sent us out there. <laughs> you guys are looking at each other like, yeah. what's going on? Yep. So when you got to Coochie, <coughs> if I recall, they had what we used to refer to as finishing school. Yep. And, and that was where they tried to... In-country orientation. Kind of, yeah. Yep. And, uh, but you I had and to pull my first ambush there with a bunch of guys that it, were... Just outside the wire. Just out, yeah. Yep. Just, yep. I remember. And so John and you had another interesting experience when you guys were waiting to be sent out to Charlie Company. You guys got on a on a rather unpleasant detail where they were making you burn and stir the human excrement. Do you remember that? Yep. Tell us just a little bit about, about what happened there. Well, we got, I don't know what we were doing, but we were standing in the wrong place anyway. They put us on a burning detail. And uh, so we went and, uh, it was, and it's just pouring rain that particular time. And uh, we went over and pulled the barrels out from under the outhouse, got them away so we didn't start the outhouse on fire. And we couldn't get them lit. We they used plain, di diesel, right? Just yeah, plain they used diesel, diesel fuel. Yeah. And, couldn't get the diesel fuel to burn, and so there was a uh, uh, maintenance, uh, weapon maintenance building over there. So I walked over there, and by gosh, there was a can of JP4, jet fuel. So I picked up a little jet fuel and went back over there and dumped it into three cans. About that time, you could hear it, the mortars coming across the compound again. So uh, I looked up and John and I says, I ain't staying here for this. So we pushed the cans back in underneath and all of a sudden here come a first sergeant from out of headquarters company walking up there. He had his poncho on and he's just lollygagging along and went into the outhouse and uh, of course, all this JP4 and diesel fuel still in those cans. And the last I looked around, we were headed for our bunker. We had a bunker there, along with some barracks, but always under a mortar tack, you went to the bunker. And I turned around and looked back, and here's the first shirt standing there with his pants around his ankles, sucking on a cigar, and he fired that cigar in one of them barrels. And the whole outhouse just disappeared. <laughs> It blew it flat level to the ground. Wow. And of course, him up, I don't know, through the wall or through the roof, wherever. But uh, then we came out, a day later, we came back out to the 
to the field. Nothing was ever said, and I wasn't going to say anything. Oh, yeah. But then uh, I was out in the field from October to February before I got hurt, and then I spent about uh, from February to March, April actually, getting back to the United States. And when I get back to the United States, I'm in Fitzsimmons Hospital in Denver, Fitzsimmons Army Hospital. And uh, I can't see at that time at all. And I'm laying in a bed with, uh, in a, in a uh, compound there in the hospital where there were 16 beds in a ward. Oh, yeah. And uh, in the next, across the aisle from me, was this guy kept telling his story. And I thought, hmm, I know something about that. And I thought, I am not saying nothing. <laughs> what was he What was he talking about? Well, he was talking about his wounds, and they were still dressing his wounds. Now, this is six months, eight months later. and He still, must have been burned really bad. Must have got burned really bad, and I suppose a lot of infection. Yeah. You know? And so, didn't you say they were still info? What do they call it when they take the dead skin? Oh, uh, they were still... Uh, I can't remember. I don't remember the term either. They were, they put gauze on there and pull them off. Yeah, debreeding. Debreeding the wound. Debreeding. Yes. Yep. And, and they were doing that. They were doing yeah. that to him on his lower hind end and legs. So, uh, needless to say, I didn't say anything because uh, I was still thinking I'm probably either going to get court martialed. Oh, yeah. So did he mention the fact that he was in the outhouse? Did he go that far? As no, it was always, I think he probably got a purple heart. And yeah. You know, God knows what else from it. Mortar wounds probably. <laughs> <laughs> I think this, as you told the story, he told everybody a mortar hit the outhouse. Yeah. Well, that's what kind of struggle <coughs> was. But. Yeah. So uh, here you are, John Cook and you, you're on a truck. And now you know you're going to Charlie Company because you've been given your yep, orders. Yep, given the orders. And what was it like uh, when you wound up at Charlie Company area and they dumped you off the deuce and a half? What was your first, what happened then? Uh, they took us right from the uh, repo depot there and after in-country orientation loaded us and we went out to a hard spot. You guys were at Crockett at that time. Yep. And you were at a hard spot up Highway 1, about two clicks maybe north of Crockett or three, I don't know, not not a long distance anyway. Walkable because we set a lot of ambushes up there mm -hmm. afterward. But, uh, yeah, and we were trucked right up to the hard spot, and I think there was only a couple of squads of you there yeah. at that hard spot. When you got to Coochie, though, they had to check you in. Yeah. The company clerk had to. Oh, yeah. And yep. t tell you a little story about the unit. And yep. then they sent you over to supply, right? Yep. Got our stuff. And your weapon. Yep. This is the first time you've actually gotten to hold a weapon. Right. The whole time Other you've been in basic Vi training. No, but yeah. I mean, in Vietnam, you, oh, were, yeah. you were without arms. Uh, without arms. <laughs> yep. You know, even I those ambush patrols, we just went out to watch. It's just. It never ceased to amaze me. I felt naked. <laughs> I mean, I felt like when they said we were going on that truck to Coochie, yeah. they said, now, we get ambushed on a regular basis, but don't worry. The guy sitting uh, uh, in the passenger seat has an M16, and he'll shoot at him out the window. Yeah. And we're sitting in the back of the truck. <laughs> sitting in an open gate truck. Wow. You know, I, that always struck me as being really strange. <laughs> so you came out to the field, yep. and who was one of the first people you met? I think you probably. Yes, you, yes, you were, was. You were waiting by the road almost, uh, trying to get rid of your duper. Yeah. I was looking. I don't think I was that looking, happened until the next day or so. I was so, looking for the first guy that, A, looked like he was stout enough to carry the, the rucksack, you know, because I couldn't have given it to some skinny guy that, you know, no. couldn't handle it. And, of course, you you know the story about how I got roped into yep, from to Joe, Joe Wascom. Yep. And so I, I think I kind of used the same sales technique as he did and explained all the fancy rounds that you had. But I closed the deal with the 45. 
Yeah. I said, and with this, you get this 45 that yeah. you get to wear. You had to be careful because if you shook it, the bullets would fall off. It, it was the worst, <laughs> honest to Pete. I, f I was afraid to wear it because it clattered. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you were going out on an ambush patrol, it would give your position away. Yep. And I, I'll never forget, I wanted to know if it worked. And so, we, remember the mad minutes they'd let us yep. do? And yep. we'd get to uh, try out our weapons try and make sure. Weapon. Yep. And uh, I'll never forget, I thought, well, I'm going to put all tracers in this thing so I can see where I'm hitting. And, and the first round that went out went off to the right. And I, I thought, did I, you know, I thought I jerked it. Yeah. And the second round went off to the left. And the third round went Straight up. up. Yeah. And I turned, Wascom was there, because he was kind of supervising me. And I said, the only way this weapon's going to work is if I can get it in their mouth. <laughs> I mean, there's not going to be any way I'm going to hit anything with this. And, of course, that was the last day I wore, I mean, yeah. that I wore that. Yeah. But I did entice you, you know. Yeah, I took it and carried it around for about two days and I threw it in a bunker. <laughs> oh, that was fun. Uh, so you joined the platoon and now you, you've got the M79 yep. and uh, you and Cook. Cook, is, if I remember correctly, did he take a machine gun right yes, off the did. bat? Yep, pretty well. It was maybe, like me, three or four or yep. five days. Yeah. But real soon he did and I think uh, him and uh, Lemire were she machine gunners. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after I started walking point with Ray and Bill and Tennant as a point team, uh, Ray got a machine oh, gun. Oh, yeah. Yep. So we and for a while, I was his assistant gunner. Yeah, yeah, you were. And, and if, if you'll recall that one night that we popped that ambush, Ray, I was feeding it, yeah. and we had, God, we had those things hooked up for Blocks. a lot of, a lot of ammo. Yes. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he, it was just going, it was just, he, I said, Ray, let up. Because remember, if you, you didn't yeah. want to get it too hot. And he looked at me and he says, I'm not pulling the trigger. Yeah. And it the barrel started, was red. They just started cooking it, off. They were cooking off as the round went in the chamber, they were cooking off. And... When, when that red turned to kind of a white and you could see the rounds going yep. out the barrel, yep. I broke the, I should have done it a long time, but I was Before like that. so surprised. Yeah. And I broke the, the yep. uh, chain there and, and it ran out. And uh, that <laughs> was at night, that was up along Highway 1 and North when we got Rocket. When we busted that ambush yep. on those. And you got the AK. Yep. And the next morning you were sitting there with it and it started firing on you. Yep. It, un <laughs> unbelievable. <coughs> but, uh, yeah, that, so, yeah, uh, John was there and, and uh, Ray, and, of course. And who else do you remember from when you first came to the platoon? Uh, Ed Rambo. Oh, yes. Sergeant Ed. I, I got the bunk with him when we got back then mm -hmm. to uh, Crockett. And he, he left shortly after that. Yeah, he Not, he'd been there. He'd been there a while. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, I always said that between Joe and Ed, they were my mentors. Yeah. You know, and and Ed Rambo, I never saw him without either a beer in his hand or a smoke in his in his mouth. Both. Ever. Most I of the time. I never. <laughs> I don't ever remember. <coughs> I took pictures of him, and every picture has either a cigarette or a beer or both. Yep. And uh, but when we left the wire, all business. Yep. Oh yeah, he was all he all was, business. He was pretty sharp. Sure. And uh, he taught me a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He and he was he was kind of a funny guy too. Uh, we were at Crockett. Do you remember when we used to go out and set up in the laterite? Yep. Uh, the little laterite pits and yep. so forth. Yep. Do you remember Claymore Larson? Yes, I do. And uh, Clement Todd. I remember. I don't remember his face, but I remember Todd. Yeah. yeah. And. Uh, I don't know why, but you know the they village the, at the Laterite Pits. The village was right across an open field. Yep. And we went out there a lot. Remember, you mentioned yep. we went out there a lot, and I couldn't believe how many times they'd come out and walk in front of us. I mean, it was like they didn't. How many times is it going to take before they, they figure out somebody's going to shoot you? <laughs> and uh, but yeah, I remember the Laterite Pits because we usually they'd put us at the bottom and then Glover. And his RTO up on the top, up yep. on the top. And uh, 
so that was that was an interesting period. Well, and you know, a lot of guys that I've talked to, they didn't see any, even in the infantry units, they didn't really see a lot of action in the when they first got there. No, and, right away. and, and we you, did. See you and I saw action the first. Yeah. The week, the first week oh, you were yeah, there, we were definitely. in. We were in. We were in into the gunfights already, and. Uh, you started walking point. Mm -hmm. And as I recall, not only did you carry an M79 with all the accoutrements in that rucksack. I didn't carry the rucksack, only once. Oh, did you? Yep. Then I got two bag, two C4 Oh, bags. That, that's right, yeah. And, and in one C4 was the, the HE and the, and the uh, what did they call the Shotgun double, double op buck. Yep. And in the other, you always had two or three cans of beer. Yep, and a couple of smokes, and the, and that w and that was your am that was your ammunition. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know that that brings back another memory. We were, I think, we were at Jackson, and remember they used to bring in the 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 C, uh, the C rations C and the rations ammo and, and the sun packs yep. and all that, and and uh, every once in a while they'd drop off beer and, yep. and sodas, and you were one of the guys that went out and. Was hauling stuff and and unloading it, and there was a six pack. Oh, well, there that, was a bunch of twelve packs in there. That the and they were they were going to keep a twelve pack. Right. And I said, uh, you're not either. And so they started <laughs> to lift off, and you started saying some unkind things. <laughs> and the guy reached out and he goes, okay, and he took a beer and he dropped it. And it was just like a whirly bird, and I thought I was going to catch it, and I did. <laughs> right over the right eye. Remember that? I had stitches. I'll never forget it as long as I live. <laughs> I had a bunch of stitches over my left eye. It hit the corner of my steel pot and just cut me wide open. Yep, yep. And, you know, speaking of, of getting hit in the head, we were, I think we were at the Trang Bang Bridge or one of those bridges, and one of our jobs was is we had to build those towers yep. and all that. And what were they? They were six-by-sixes or? Well, we put roofs on it. That's when we were building reed. Oh, Reed, yeah, yep. and but you—that's the first time I ever, personally, I had ever seen a chainsaw. Oh, in use, and they brought this thing out, and I thought, well, I don't know who's gonna. Joe was trying to start it. And yeah, get and it and, I, and I said I don't know anything about him, and of course Moose walks over there and says, here, let me show you how this is done, <laughs> and you fiddled with it a little bit, and I, I've never to this day seen a guy start a chainsaw like this. He just grabbed the handle and he threw that chainsaw out, and of course it took the thing and brrr and came back and you caught it yeah. and went to work. <laughs> and so Moose was cutting the big timbers. These were these were good sized timbers. Yeah. And then we'd go over and pick up the cut pieces and we'd haul them and so forth. And and Ray and I went over one time and we we were carrying them on our shoulders. And of course quite a bit was sticking out up the back and and I wasn't looking and Moose wasn't looking and we turned and that we hit you in the head yep. with that six by six, and it was the only time in Vietnam I ever saw you go to your knees. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of rattled my cage. <laughs> and and so that was the second headshot that you got in Vietnam. Yeah. And of course, do you remember how sympathetic Ray and I were? Oh yeah, he just turned around and kept going. I said, "Did we laugh? Probably. I would imagine. I don't know." I think I was unconscious for a while. <laughs> Did you get a Purple Heart for that? I don't think so. No. I I don't. <laughs> Neither one of us would put you in for one. Uh, do you remember the, the very first time when you got there, what was the first ambush patrol that you pulled? First ambush patrol that I pulled? Well, a practice one in Coochie. No, no, I mean, after I mean that, you, after uh, yeah. out of Crockett. We used to go out of the north side of Crockett, around mm -hmm. the hedgerows, out into the rice paddies there. I think we pulled up there three or four times. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we used to go west across the gravel, and the dirt road going to Tate Inn. Mm -hmm. And uh, we set up a bunch over there. That's where I refused to take you guys into a that's another no fire zone. Yeah, that's another story we'll get to. Oh, okay. But, uh, so when was the first time you actually got to shoot on purpose? 
I think that night we broke up in the ladder. I pits was the first time that I really yep. unloaded. Yep. And so that was your introduction. Yeah. To that now it's serious. Yep. Yep. Now it's serious. When was the first time that you remember us getting shot at? Well, that same time, but. Uh, Hmm. Weren't we north of Reed and pulled that ambush when Tennant got it that night? That was that was a bad one. That was a tough one. Yeah, that yep. was a bad one. Yep. That and was, that was there was a lot of a lot of recourse there. What is what is your memory of the first guy that you remember that got hurt? Well, it would have been, I think it was Tennant that night, or was it, was it uh, Sugar Bear? No, he got, he got it at uh, Diamond. Diamond, okay. Sugar, uh, when, when Tennant got it that night on the ambush that we popped on, mm -hmm. the, I don't know, Five Gooks, I think it was. Yeah. And uh, that was the first guy, and, and well, and then you torched the guy with the, Law mm -hmm. that was on the same ambush. Yeah, and then the next morning, well, we had to move that ambush site to the other side of that little valley. Yep, and in the morning they wanted us to go back out north to the gravel road again, and we walked through that uh, minefield, and I didn't realize it until we were in it because mm -hmm. there was nothing marking the backside of it, but the front side of it was marked. Mm -hmm. We got about halfway through there, and Bill Butler stepped on a small Chicom grenade, maybe. Yeah, well, I don't even think it was that big. I wonder if it wasn't just like a uh, AK round or something with a with a pressure device on it. But it just picked his leg up and kind of sawed one corner of the boot off and put a little piece of shrapnel in his arm. Of course, Bill and I were together all the time. Yeah. And. Uh, did it throw his leg up over his head? Yeah, it just about. It just about tipped him over. Yeah. And uh, that was when I first realized that we were in a in a uh, minefield. Mm -hmm. So then we just kind of, I think Doc went over in there. Maybe that was, uh, wasn't Doc. Maybe it was, uh, who was the first Doc? Uh, Wolf? Wolf, maybe. Mm -hmm. Went and over and checked him out and put a little bandage on his arm to keep it. And you know, that's an interesting point because we went through medics wholesale. Yeah. There was a time where a medic, if he was with us for two weeks, we time. didn't even have time enough to know who he was. Yeah. And one of the problems was is they had nowhere to assignment. They right. had nowhere to be and they would walk back and forth between the files, yep. and most of them got booby-trapped. Or they'd be up on a berm where they shouldn't be. And yeah, they, and they'd, silhouetted. And, yeah. And, and they, yeah, I, that amazed me. We, I didn't even, I, I know we went through three medics, I can't even tell you what their names are. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. It, it was Wolf, I remember him, yep. but very shortly. That wasn't a long time. Yep, yep. And, and then we had... Uh, Doc Turner, of course. Doc Turner, but he was towards the end. Mm -hmm. There was... I think two in between. Yeah, and that was in three, four months. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, they we went through them really quick. Uh, who were your closest buddies while you were in Vietnam? Well, you and Ray and Butler, of course. Jack Slovy. Slovy. Yep. And uh, Bill Tennant was always RTO when I started mm -hmm. having a point team. He was there. That was probably the closest ones uh, that I spent any direct amount of time with. Sure. You know, I mean, if we were down resupply or whatever, or back at, at uh, Coochie, or even in the base camps, you all sat around. And, sure. You know, but uh, the guys I dealt most with were those, those five guys. Do you remember when uh, Jamie O'Brien came into the platoon? Was our platoon leader? Yes, I do. And uh, right after Cy, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. as a matter of fact. Right after Cy. But he was—he wasn't the kind of guy that got close to anybody. Anybody. 
and so we didn't have we didn't really have a chance to figure him out. No. In in the beginning, so you couldn't quite figure out where where he was coming from. Right. But he acted like he knew what he was doing, and yeah, and he yeah. was very disciplined and so forth. But one of the things that we didn't realize is that Jamie had a little trouble at night uh, Reading following maps. maps. <laughs> Do you remember on one occasion when we were we were going out on an ambush patrol? And this particular ambush patrol was a pretty good distance. I mean, it, most yeah. of the time we'd be within a couple of clicks. Yep. This one was about three. And I remember very well. Tell, tell me what you remember about three that. and a half clicks out, and uh, well, Hedgie always wondered how I. I knew where we were going because I wasn't supposed to have a map. Mm -hmm. And I said, because I told Jamie I wasn't leading anybody until mm -hmm. I had at least looked at the map. So I always looked at the map during the day and I'd find where we were supposed to set up and I'd count the berms that we crossed before we made a turn. Or, and now that particular night, and I'll never forget it, we walked out over 13 berms and came through a pinch point where the four hedgerows came together and all that was there was an arc cart trail going straight through. And we had to go through that to get on the other side mm -hmm. and when we got up there, uh, Jamie wanted me to go farther and I said, no, this is our spot. And uh, he said, no, he says, we still got probably a half a click to go. And I says, well, that next berm up there is the edge of our free, free fire zone and I'm not crossing. Yep. I'm not taking these guys out in a free fire zone. And unfortunately, Jamie, w under his own devices, to prove you wrong, decided that he was going to call in a marking round. Yep. And and to show that he knew exactly where he was, where he was at. And when that marking round went off, it was how far away from oh, us? Oh, 100 yards, maybe. Oh yeah, at least. Yeah. And and it went off, and I remember he was grumbling and carrying on and whatnot, and. Uh, and uh, the next thing you know, he's rethinking, and then I think he, he made the we statement. Moved, he called in, we moved from our location. Yep. But the amazing part about that night was, is that you, you stopped. You wouldn't go. Yeah. I mean, you know, and that was unheard of. Well, that could have cost me quite a bit. But that was unheard of. Well, you know, yeah. if they told you to keep going, you'd go. But, but you had the, the wherewithal or the sense you know, and I always thought it was because you were a farm boy. You know, I mean, from Minnesota, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you knew how to run a chainsaw. <laughs> and and so I just thought you had, had uh, savvy. I mean, I really did. I thought you, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, in the woods or in the yeah. outdoors, I thought you were the guy. Yeah. And uh, it turned out that night that you probably saved all of our lives. A bunch but, of us, yeah. By, by, by not going out. Yeah, because so, later on, uh, I don't know. Two, three, four o'clock in the morning. They did free fire on that area. Oh yes. Yeah, and we got to watch it, but we were probably, I don't know, half a click away. But yeah, then. yeah. The, when they shot the artillery. Yep. The harassment and yep. interdictment. H and, H and I. I. Yeah. And do you remember Sergeant Marquez? Yes, I do. And what what do you remember about him? He was a pretty tough old dude from Puerto uh, Rico. Puerto Rico or. Uh, was he Puerto Rican? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but anyway, the slang that he talked with was all everybody always teased each other about it. Oh yeah. You didn't dare tease him about yeah. it. Yeah. We kind of mocked him <laughs> a little bit. But he was he was a hell of a first sergeant. He, he, well, he, he was a pro. Yeah. Well, he'd been to Korea, wasn't he? And, and a couple of tours of Vietnam. And a couple of tours in Vietnam before he got to us. Yeah. Uh, and he was another one that didn't want to get too. Too close, close to, anybody. to everybody, and and I realized why later, much yep. later, it's because he every man that he ever lost, he took personally. Personally, oh yeah. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but whenever yeah. whenever we got a guy hurt or killed, he'd disappear for a day. Yeah. He'd go back to Coochie, and he'd go see graves and registration. He wanted to make sure, he wanted to make sure that was our. Our, man. our guy and that they didn't make any mistakes. Yep. And the wounded, he went to the hospital. Yep. Uh, I mean, and I didn't, nobody I knew. I remember him coming in and seeing But me. nobody knew that. Yeah. I mean, he just disappeared for yep. for a day or yep. two. And uh, I, I remember, I thought, you know, Sergeant Marquez was a guy you could hate, 
because he made you do stuff. Yep. He Absolutely. Was, he, he there was, was no questions. When he told you to he do was, something. He was a professional soldier. Yeah. And I remember a couple of the guys let their hair grow long, and that wasn't going to do it in his army. No, sure. And wasn't. if your fatigues were tore up, that wasn't going to be in his arm. You know, no. you guys were going to be strack. And, yeah. But he didn't go so far as to make you polish your boots or anything. Oh, but, no, no. But he was all Army and all pro. Yep. And I've said this. Very and, organized. And you've said it, too. He saved our lives. I can't even count. I can't even remember. More than a few times. Yep. Yeah. And now, there was a guy that could not only read a map, he could put an artillery shell on a, a 50, <laughs> on a 50 cent piece the first round. Yeah, he could. He, he was good. And he always, remember when he'd take us out on ambush patrols? In the day, he'd take us right by it yep. and stop. And stop. In five minutes, we'd, and the word would come back. Look to your left. This is where, where we're going to be tonight. So everybody got a chance to look at the lay of the mm -hmm. land. And a lot of times we set up next to graveyards, remember? Yep, yep. A and, lot of times. And, uh, and then that night when we did go out there, then when we got there, we knew. I mean, it wasn't like we were... Well, it was, it was familiar anyway. Yeah. You, you might not know exactly where you're yeah. going to be spotted, but you're going to be there. Do you, uh, do you remember the night that we went out on an ambush patrol and it was so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face? Yes. And yes. every guy had to hold the guy in front yeah. of him? Yep. Hold on to his web gear, hold on to his shirt sleeve or you something. You know, I tell people that and people say it couldn't be that dark. Oh, it can get that dark. In, in Vietnam, if it's overcast and there's no starlight, yep. brother, it's dark. it could get really dark. And uh, so tell me about walking point. What did what, You walked point for quite a long time. Yeah, I walked point from probably towards the end of October till, the, till I got hurt the yeah. 4th of February. What was your, why did you want to walk point? I don't know. I, I was just comfortable up there. And I, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't comfortable back in uh, in a squad. Yeah, yeah. You know? uh, I I my memory is a little short here, so you're going to have to help me. Did you ever walk us into an ambush? I don't think so. I don't either. I don't think I did. And you were you the were worst one? thing I think was that walked us into that booby trap or that minefield. Yep. And tell us a little bit about. When we when we headed out to the ambush patrol and it was just getting dark, and we left the wire and we'd gone, I don't know, probably a half a click. And, and you the company busted on. No, no, not that no. one. And you stopped us and everybody got down, and the next thing you know, there's a, a gunshot. And every of course everybody freaked out because they figured we're game on. Yeah. But nothing, one shot. Yeah. And. And everybody's going, well, what, you know, what are we going to do here? And so the word got back, we're getting up and we're going to go. Moose just shot a python. <laughs> do, you, yeah. do, you, do you remember that? Yeah, that wasn't an ambush patrol, though. That was out by the, out by the border. Oh, I thought, I thought it was an ambush we were going on. No. Because I remember we all we stepped over. We were going on a big... Uh, we all stepped over it. Yep, yep. We were going on a big battalion sweep because we later on that day we said... Uh, I think we did stay overnight out in the uh, B-52 craters. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right on the edge of that. And that was that day. And we stayed overnight, and then the next morning we came back. And uh, uh, Jamie wanted that snake back in camp because yeah. he was going to clean it, yeah. skin it. He wanted to skin Do you remember about how long it was? I'm thinking maybe 15, 16 feet. It was yeah. big. Yeah, and yeah. it took several of us to... Yeah, it was as big as a... Big around as a football. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's no kidding. And it was, it was still pretty scary when I stepped off of that berm and it was hissing at me. I know that. And it was alive when we came back. Yeah, yeah, it was. Still it was alive. still. I mean, it wasn't going anywhere, but it was still a rat. Yep, rolling around. So that that I'll never forget that. Me neither. And what was the? <laughs> oh, you you were gonna. What was the other thing you were gonna bring up when? Uh, before I said about the python, you were saying we were going out or doing something on? I lost it now. Uh, yeah. Move on. There was so many. There was so many. Yeah, you we know, went on ambush probably, what, five, six times a week? Yeah. Uh, and, and it was especially hard because they'd make us go on day rifts. 
Yep. And walk us all day in the heat and then send us out at night. Yeah, you'd get about an hour or two to settle down at, yep. at night and, and uh, back out in the field again. Back so for an LP. did you ever get an R&R? &R? No. In country, I got two in country r, &R. Okay. Tell us about that. Uh, went down to Vung Tau and basically got drunk and came back to because they only had three uh, three days. Right. So you'd uh, I went into Coochie. They'd load you up in a in a chopper, fly you out to the coast there to Vung Tau, and uh, by the time you got oriented or into a hotel or motel, you went down to the bar and mm -hmm. probably spent the three days there and sure. turned around and came back. And then I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you got a Soldier of the Month award. Yes. And that was, you went. For both of them. Yeah. yeah. And was that Wang Tao too? As yep. Well? Okay. Yep. So, yeah, I remember we were all pretty pissed off about that. <laughs> about. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know where the Soldier of the Month thing came from. Well, I th we always thought you were greasing somebody's palm. Well. You know, back in. I didn't have any money. Back in the company <laughs> area. <laughs> And Kelly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so in February, uh, that was a that was a interesting month. Uh, that was a tough month. A tell us tough. tell us as accurately as you can about the day that we went out to rescue the LERPs. Well, that would would have been the day, the the morning of the night that I got hurt. Exactly. So tell us about how that morning started. Uh, well, we got on a on a we got a call to go out and rescue what five lerps yep. squad that had been pinned down, and there were I think three of them dead when we heard that, yep. and two that were wounded. Yeah. So we were in a rush to get out there and see if we could police them up and save them. Well, we landed up on the high rice up there, and it was right on the edge of the hobos, as I remember. Yes, it was. And uh, we got set up as a company, walked uh, I, I again was on point with Ray and Bill and the boys, and uh, we went right by where they were at at first, through the rice, and then I forget if Joe was walking flank on the left, but he spotted one of them. Hmm. And word came up to me anyway. So we just reversed and backed out of there a couple of hundred yards and then worked our way down in there. But by the time we got down there, we were taking fire. Mm -hmm. And a lot of fire. I mean, it was there was pretty good gunfight going on there for three or four hours, as I remember it. And... Uh, Jamie and I and Nasal. Uh, Nasal was Paul was uh, Jamie's radio man, and we had flanked off to the right side of a of a of a spider hole mm -hmm. where there was an AK fire and all those popping down. up and up and he'd pop up and down, pop up and down, and and uh, of course by then he had a quite a bit of support behind him and uh, we tried to flank him and get in there and we just couldn't do it. We couldn't couldn't get up there and I wasn't, I was a little shy of firing a duper round in there for one of those guys was still alive. Sure, oh yeah. And uh, you know it was it was just uh, kind of a no-win situation and then uh, Greg Boosie came in with a uh, with the uh, C model gunship and smoke. And uh, we went in, got the guys, and backed out of there, as I remember it. And a helicopter came for them. Yep, uh, we, pulled, we put them back up mm -hmm. where we landed, up on the hill, and uh, then they got a, a chopper in for them. Or did we support them right there with a chopper? No, I think they were moved. I think we moved Yeah. Because it was too hot down there. Yeah. There was just way oh, too much well, lead flying. Yep, yep. And uh, we moved them back up on the rice fields, and and then we got a 
dust off in there and loaded them. And right there is where we set up a hard spot again for that night, or at least a night longer. Mm -hmm. uh, they came with Chinooks and flew wire and bags, and we basically built a perimeter there in about four hours. Mm -hmm. We got it kind of set up. It was pretty quiet. We knew there was some movement. You know, you could see the movement down there on the hedgerows. And uh, we sent out an LP to a little, uh, one of those little greeneries. Yep. And I think there was three guys on that LP, mm -hmm. and I don't remember who they were. But uh, about midnight, I think it was, 11 o'clock, 11.30, uh, we settled down enough to open some sea rations and have something to eat. And I opened up one of those units with the scrambled eggs in it, and I said, if I got to eat this shit, I'm going to die. And about that time, the bullets started flying. I heaved that can over the top, grabbed the duper, and I had dug a little, uh, like a manhole, mm -hmm. next to the bunker, and I was sitting in there firing duper rounds, and I fired them for, it seemed like forever. Well, mm -hmm. it had to be quite a while, because I think I shot everything but about a dozen out of a bag of 80. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, then I took that, or we took that RPG right into the bunker there where I was, and I was probably 10 feet away from the bunker, 20 feet away from the bunker, and I got a lot of shock going, sand, blast, and that's when uh, Russ got it in the eyes, he got a lot of sand. Where was he in relationship to you? He was right behind the bunker, he had his 90 set up on top of the bunker. And, uh, As you recall, were there multiple RPG rounds that they were throwing us there? Yes, there was. There were a lot of mm -hmm. RPG rounds. And so, I'm, I, I don't know this, but I mean, after you were wounded, were you knocked out? Were you cold? Well, I was, I was kind of too. I, actually, uh, some of the bunker had collapsed against me, and Doc came over. Of course, I was hollering for a medic, and Doc came over, Bruns was hollering, and we weren't probably 20 feet apart. Mm -hmm. But then uh, Doc came in, and he took one look at me and puked all over me. And he said, I'll be right back. And I think he went and worked on Bruns for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then came back to me, and by then I had pulled myself out from under that junk in the garbage, because you know, those, those bunkers were made out of engineer stations sure, and sandbags. Yeah, exactly. And uh, anyway, then Doc started bundling me up, and then after that I don't remember. He gave me a morphine shot, and I, after that I don't remember much. What is the next thing you remembered? I think climbing on that chopper, climbing on that dust off. And I don't know if somebody helped me or if I ran to it or... Well, I can almost guarantee you didn't run to it. Yeah, I was pretty messed up. You were, you were hurt really bad. What, where, where did you get injured? I didn't, you didn't tell us. Where? What, what part of your body, yeah. When, when you well, said, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And uh, it was all shrapnel? Shrapnel and small arms. Okay. I got a couple of small arms I holes in me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, shrapnel, uh, Cut off a couple of toes, mm. cut one kidney, uh, punctured a lung, tore up my arm and mm. hand and wrist. I got pins in both knees. Uh, you know what Matt told us? He said, you know, through the years as we were growing up, Dad didn't wear a lot of clothes when he got out of bed in the morning. <laughs> and he said, my brother and I used to go over and look at all the belly buttons that he had. 18 oh, belly yeah. buttons. <laughs> <laughs> Just really what we need on the news. <laughs> yeah, but he said he remembers that just like it was yesterday. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. And so. I uh, got two pretty neat boys. Oh, yeah. And now, were you? did they take you to Coochie first? 12 Devac. In Coochie. Yep. And, and I was there. Were you conscious now? I mean, did you know pretty much what it I was? No. 
I, I didn't know much, probably, if, I think I was, I'm not sure I wasn't in an induced coma for about a week. Yeah, I was going to say they probably had you doped up yep. good. And uh, then I kind of came to, but I couldn't see anything, couldn't do anything, laid there on a gurney. And uh, I was there, I think, about maybe 13 or 14 days. But one of those 10 days, about the 10th or 12th day, well, I had to be there longer than that because that was the 4th of February and Paul got hurt the 23rd. And we met in the hallway. Oh my goodness. He recognized my voice and I recognized his. And I just hollered, Nace, is that you? And he was going one direction in the wow. journey and I was going the other, back to surgery or wherever. And, uh, then they shipped me out of there. I went down to 2050 back. Was that Saigon? Uh, I think, in yeah. Saigon. I was only there for a few days and then airlifted to Japan. Mm -hmm. And I spent... Uh, and all this time, you can't see anything? Oh, no, I can't see you anything. Had, you had the bandages on? And oh, no, I couldn't see even if I had No, I know, but yeah, I, mean, but I was bandaged. Yeah. I'd had several eye surgeries by then. And then I stopped in Yokota, uh, well, at the, at the Army Hospital there in Japan. And uh, I was there about two, two and a half weeks. And I uh, had some more surgeries and redid some wounds, had another eye surgery. Did they have to do surgery on your foot? Oh, yeah. But that... All they did was stitch up my foot. I didn't get the stitches out of my foot until I was back at Fitzsimmons. Oh my gosh. Uh, when, when you talk about your eyesight, was it shrapnel that went in your eyes? Is that shrapnel what? and sand, and wood chips, and everything. It's, yeah, there's still, I still have metal floating around in my eyes. Mm. So when you get to Japan, you're you're laying there, obviously, and, yep. and doctors are talking to you, and yep. they're telling you what, yep. what the, assess doing. the assessment is. Yep. Yep. Did you think at any time, because did you think I'm blind? Oh yeah. I mean, did you think this is it? I yep. mean, this is pretty much. I had I had uh, I had succumbed to the fact that uh, I wasn't going to see good again for damn sure. Yep. And as and, and probably as, not at all. And as active as you were and outdoors and everything, oh, yeah. w was that just like about the most discouraging? It was. That was that was the biggest thing, and still is today. Yeah. You know, I do what I want to do, but yep. it's it's tough. The things I got to be able to see to do is tough. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, then I went from you from Japan to Hawaii. I got to spend two weeks in Hawaii and never saw anything, so and, to speak. <laughs> yeah. And uh, did you have any of those drinks with the umbrellas and stuff in them? Nope, I was in the hospital. I know, they didn't bring any. <laughs> they didn't bring any in, no. <laughs> no beer, no drinks. Uh, and you'd probably given anything for a cold one. Oh, man. <laughs> I, uh, and from there, I went to Oakland. We flew a C-130 hospital ship from, oh my. from Hawaii to... Oakland, and when we landed in Oakland, my center line was all opened up again from the vibration and the shaking and the rattling and the rolling. And, and, uh, and those those one thirties seemed like they were coming apart when we were right in those oh, things. Oh, they did. In the hospital ships, you know, we were. As I remember it. We were stacked five oh. high, two rows in the middle and a row on the outside, and a little narrow aisle way for the nurse and doctor to walk up and down through. But anyway, I got Did that open. seem like a long flight? Uh, yeah, but it seemed like forever. Yeah. Especially when I noticed I was bleeding and coming apart again, you know, and of course then the nurses came and they taped it all up and got, mm -hmm. got me sewed back together so I didn't yep. fall apart. But uh, then when I got to Oakland, I had surgery again, stitched that all back up. I was only there maybe f four or five days. And then they flew me to, to uh, Denver, to mm -hmm. Fitzsimmons Army Hospital in Denver. 
And that's where I met Bill Calhoun and oh, yes. several other surgeons there. But uh, Bill had just gotten back from overseas and he had taken some schooling overseas. And this was several days after I'd been there. And he came in and he says, I think I might have a procedure that can help you. Like an experimental? Yep. He says, I don't know. He says, I, I know it will help you some, but he says, I don't know the extent of it. But, uh, and at that time, well, Russ and I were on the same ward. And, uh, at that time, what did you have to lose? Yeah, I, I had nothing to lose at that, that point. And I said, well, Bill, he said, you think about it overnight. And I said, nah. I said, you set it up. We're going we're gonna to do it. So he set it up, and we went in. I did the surgery. I came out of surgery, and the next morning he came in my room and took the patches off, and I could see the daylight. I could see the lights in the room. And the day after, and he bandaged me back up, put some stuff in my eyes, and cleaned them up a little bit. He came in the next day, and he handed me uh, the uh, Denver paper. And I could see the big print, the bold print mm -hmm. on the Denver paper. And you were probably just going, oh, man, I was nuts. this is I was, great. I was just nuts. Well, long story short, I had, uh, I don't know. Multiple. Bill operated on me. I don't know. Were you um, on a first name know. basis with the anesthesiologist? Well, yeah, well uh, some of them. <laughs> More than one. <laughs> but uh, and a few pretty nurses that would come around. And oh yes, yes. Uh, but uh, overall, do you think that you got really good care at Fitzsimmons? Absolutely. And that they, the staff, really the best. Yeah. I got a, another little story though that after I'd had about four eye surgeries, one day I was, I felt the side of my, laying in bed and something was itching. And I felt and there was something there. So I had the surgeon come in and look at it. And he says, oh, he said, I gotta send you down to x-ray. So they sent me down to x-ray and I had a piece of shrapnel in me about like that. Right here, still carries a of course. And the surgeon says, well, I think we could do this without putting you to sleep. Hey. So, it's just going to be a little skin, open a little skin. Yeah. Up. He says, I'll just lance it and, you know, we'll open it up and take it out. What do I say? Yeah, I guess. You're, You're in charge. charge. Knows. You're in charge. <laughs> so uh, I went back to my room and he came in with a cart and a nurse and gave me a couple of shots of local anesthetic there and kind of opened it up a little bit and he got a hold of it with the tweezers and gave it a pull while well, the back end of it was stuck in my bowel again. So I'm there stitching that up, fixing that, an emergency. Because that's a bad deal. Oh, yeah. Bow bowels, if yeah. you puncture them, yep. and that's I got a bad deal. Did that, he know it was in the bowel? No. Oh, no. No. So he ripped it right out of the bowel. Yep. Oh. And... Uh, of course, right now it's emergency surgery. I go down to emergency surgery and they open my center line again. Oh. I just could have put a zipper on that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it was just uh, one of those things. You know, yep. you, they had no intentions of making a mistake like that, but yeah. it was one of those things. And of course, in your case, you had so many wounds. Oh, yeah. I mean, you just had so many. Yeah. That, like you said, from yeah. the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Oh, so yeah. They were probably just trying to figure out what's the the worst one we should do. Yeah, they do, were just know. taking steps and yeah. doing what they could do to, to solve the problems, you know, as they came up. And uh, But it was probably, uh, well, I was at Fitzsimmons for 38 months. Wow. And then I got home. And you were a two-year guy. Yeah, like I say, I had to re-up so, to get out of the hospital. Yep. Otherwise, I'd have lost my benefits. 
if I hadn't stayed in the, mm -hmm. in the Army. Did they try to talk you into signing those papers? Nope. Well, yeah, early on they wanted me yep. to sign a, a cash contract. Yep. You know. But, but as I uh, recall, you had somebody... I had an uncle that was head of veteran services in Kansas. And, uh, and he, uh, he came out to see me as quick as I got up where I could get around a little bit. And advised me what to do and what not to do. And so uh, everything I got that they sent me or brought in to me, I'd sign the envelope and I'd have a nurse come put his address on it, and it all got sent to him, and he processed it all. Oh my gosh! Back. But uh, but wasn't he the one that said sign nothing? Yep, yep, sign absolutely nothing. Just you know, I'd sign the envelope so that you received that Simmons it. knew that I received it, yep. and then I'd send it right on to to him. He was uh, in a veteran service office in. Uh, well, they lived in Overland Park, but uh, I think his office was kind of downtown. I just don't remember. So the day finally came when I got said, shipped out of Fitzsimmons and uh, back home, and uh, I could drive by then. I had, I had improved enough. I bought a car there. A little old yellow con or a little green convertible, Oldsmobile convertible, that uh, we drove for quite a while, Patty and I. Were you married before you went to Vietnam? No. I met Patty. I was catering. Uh, I was always cooking all my life. I've cooked. My grandpa taught me how to cook, and my grandma was a cook. And By the way, you make the best peppered bacon I've ever eaten in my <laughs> life. <laughs> but... Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's not much to do in making peppered bacon, but it's the best I've ever had. <laughs> but anyway, I was catering a party uh, for some friends of mine, and Patty's folks happened to be there, and of course I'd met them through the Legion Club. They knew me through the American Legion there, where you guys had mm -hmm. gone a couple of times. And uh, they were at this party, and she came from I think from school. No, I was going to head back. They were going to head back to school. And uh, I said, gosh, they had all the stereo equipment set up on my pickup truck. Well, I says, gosh, if they didn't have all that stereo equipment set up there, we could go to a movie. I'm done doing what I'm doing here. Well, about 15 minutes later, I had the stuff off my truck and we went to a movie. <laughs> so officially, this was your first date? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, had you gone together before that? No. no. This we was knew actually each other. right we knew the each first. Other. Yeah. We knew each other. And, and what were you thinking? Uh, well, I just said. She can't say that. <laughs> I just said, well, that would be nice. And then he comes back and he says, well, are you ready? I go, ready for what? To go to a movie. I go, oh, dear. <laughs> so that was the beginning. That was the beginning. And then how long after that did you guys get married? Well, that was probably in June. That was one year. Maybe it was a, it was a year later anyway we got married. Yeah. And then how long after that did you start having a family? Uh, four years. Four years. And tell us a little bit about your kids. Well, we lived in a trailer at first. Uh, I was going to kidnap her after the wedding and move right to Colorado. Hmm. But uh, that didn't transpire, so her mother got the best of me. She says, uh, <laughs> where are you guys going to live? You aren't living with us. <laughs> so a, woman, I, a woman of wisdom. Yes. But anyway, we bought a trailer, moved into that, and uh, we lived there for f four years, five years? Two. Well, we were there longer than two, no, weren't we? a year and a half, two. Well, I guess, yep. Yeah. And then uh, we started looking for a place and uh, bought the place we're in. And the schoolhouse? Yep. Well, I'll be bought the big school. 
Now, what were you doing for a living in those days? I was working for my dad at that time. And uh, then he got hurt that winter and couldn't run the business anymore, and I wasn't able to run the business. Actually, he got hurt the year before we got married and wanted me to take over the business, but I couldn't do it. Was it because of physically? You yeah, yeah, I just couldn't. And it was it was a pretty good sized business. He had like uh, at that time probably twenty five people working for him. Okay. It. And did you stay in touch with any of the guys after you got home? I think Ray. I called Ray once or twice, and that's the only. And Russ. Yeah. Yeah. Russ Bruns. I think you kept in touch with him, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I called Russ a couple of times too. And then Bill Calhoun, and, of and course. Bill Calhoun. Bill and, and I. Bill Bill and Bill oh, Butler. But, that's right. That's right. Bill Butler and I stayed in contact. But uh, Bill Calhoun, my eye surgeon, was the best man at our wedding. I'll be darned. Uh, what is your definition of a hero? Boy, I have <laughs> definition of a hero. That stumps me. Did I you don't know. I. Have you ever known any heroes? All of them. I don't. I don't consider anybody that I served with in Vietnam and lots of other ones, mm -hmm. but especially the ones that I served with. I mean, there were so many, and you know it, so many instances that somebody covered somebody's backside uh, when they had no suspect that there was anything going on. And, and covered fire for each other and, and drug people out of places and Drug and the helicopters, and those are heroes to me. Somebody that'll save his brother, regardless. What was your impression of the first reunion? Very good. I mean, when you saw, was it surreal when oh, you when you saw these unbelievable. guys? Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. Did you notice that their voices were all the same? Yes. And they picked up right where they left right off where in they Vietnam. Left off. Yep. That's a phenomenon. Remember this. Remember that. And it it was just like yesterday. It was. Yep. You know, and that was 25 years later? Yeah. Something like that? Yep. And so you kind of said, hey, I want to help with doing this and uh -huh. stuff. And so you, you became one of my biggest supporters. And then one day you called and you said, hey, do you think the guys would want to go fishing? Yep. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Bill Butler and I and Ray made a tape when we were on the Fukong Bridge mm -hmm. that Christmas. A Christmas tape to send. We made three copies of it. Mm -hmm. Had three little of those little disc recorders. Oh, sure, yeah. Real we recorder all set up. We all passed around. Yep. And we had one three guy of them got set up <laughs> and, and uh, copied it, and uh, everybody sent one to their folk. Mm -hmm. And uh, for whatever reason, we had, we had talked about going fishing, uh, sitting around the bunker there or whatever the deal was, anyway. And uh, it just dawned on me, and I called you and I said, do you think you guys would like to do a fishing trip? And I may have called Ray first, and he said, oh yeah, I'd love to. And, uh, but that was kind of the turning point in yep. it. And the next year, I think it was, the reunion in Branson. And then we decided every other... Every other year we'd try and do it and, and get it going. And we had, what, three? Or was it four? Four, maybe. Four fishing trips. I and think. and you had some buddies yep. that, you, that you used to beat for coffee at my the bar. My other brothers. Huh? Yeah. My other brothers. And... Uh, <laughs> They kind of got wind of what you yep. were doing. Yep, and they wanted to help. And they wanted to bring boats and cook and fillet fish, and, and that was uh, that was really neat. They they respect you guys more than you'll ever know. Yep, and and having said that, you know, I I knew that these guys, you know, this was a big commitment. To come, to come and spend that time and do all that work. 
So I had planned that I wanted to give them some kind of recognition. And remember when we got them all on the porch? Oh. And I stepped up and I started giving my, my speech. And I pulled a handful of our challenge coins out of my pocket. Yeah. And I presented a challenge coin. Do you remember what, uh, Kenny, what his reaction was when he I started had crying? And the next one? W was crying. And the next one? Barry, he and, choked and up. I'm, whoa, and I'm <laughs> telling you, that, I'm, I can't even describe to you what, how that affected me. And a couple of them, well, I think they all still got them. A couple of them carry them, and a couple of them got them. Yep. Put in a shadow and, box. And Kenny told me that I'll never be without this. No. And he, he, he has his in his pocket today. right now. Yep. And, you know, one of the things that, that I remember, and I'll never forget as long as I live, is, and we weren't even sure we were going to get to light a fire. You know, remember yeah. that? The, and, and somehow or another, Steve got wood and stuff. Do you remember that first night we had that, everybody was in a circle and we had that fire? Yeah. And, and I remember you called it a gratitude meeting. Yep. And have you ever been amongst men ever in your life that was as sincere and no. honest with each other? No. no. And, and uh, you know, a gratitude be meeting is, you know, let's look at what we have to be thankful for. Yeah. Wasn't that one of the most unbelievable? Unbelievable. Me. And they me, still are. They me too. Yep. And Doc Turner, of course, singing and playing. Singing and, and playing. Yep. And, uh, yep, that, I'm telling you, that was, I, I believe in my heart that that, for those guys, that was a turning point. Yep. You know, that really, w that was really a turning point. And, uh, you know what, that would never have happened if it wasn't for you. Well. Never. It would have never happened. No, it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for you. No. Because you don't want to get us together in the first place. Well, but I mean, <laughs> those fishing trips were just, Unbelievable, yeah, yeah. and uh, so your grandson and his son and his son's sons someday somebody's going to bring your name up. Oh, I hope. And they're going to say, and they're going to say, you know, great granddad fought in the Vietnam War, and somebody will remember that. You want to see what your granddad looked like? You want to hear your granddad? Well, we're just going to go on this website, and we're going to we're going to show you, and they're going to watch this. So what I'd like is to give you a chance to give. What advice would you give those those generations to come? Boy, that's. Uh I think one thing I'd like to instill on, on all the generations to come is to love this country. They don't, a lot of people, even our age, have no idea what it's like to live or be in other countries. Not that other countries aren't nice and, and don't have good laws and regulations and government aren't nice places to live and raise a family, but for me anyway, there's something special about the United States. My follow-up question is, is what does the American flag mean to you? Everything, everything. Patty wants me to get mine down because it's getting a little torn up and it's too cold to go do that, so it's gonna stay I, there. I go through one a year. Yeah. I, I would guess mine probably makes it two years, mm -hmm. but it's it's getting in bad shape now. Moose, the last thing I want to ask you is what has Patty meant to you all these years? She's my rock. She stood behind me through thick and thin alcoholism, on and on. I wouldn't be here without her. She saved you? Without question. What would you have to say to her? I love you, dear. I don't know what I'd ever done without you. Thank you, Moose, Thanks, for coming. Buddy. And, and you know, you're, you're my brother forever. Absolutely. Yep. Always. Yep. Thanks, Johnny.